When I was very little, like five or six I'd say, my dad used to take me on all sorts of adventures through nature, especially when we owned a little cottage up in the Scottish Highlands. Now, my dad is sort of a combo between a, an Irish bloke plus a Yorkshire laddie type of fellow and very spry, despite his being about 55 at the time. And on this particular occasion, I decided that we were going to go hiking way up in the cliffs. I was quite happy with this development as it meant a piggyback ride for at least 90% of the difficult bits. This was a, a proper proper trek too. He wanted to get to one of the highest bluffs so that we could have an amazing 360 degree view of the gorgeous meadows and some sparkling sea. But after we reached the top of the plains where it's all short wind whipped grass and you can see for miles, he suddenly turned very still and very quiet. But when you're small, your parents are like God, so seeing your dad look frightened is scarier than anything your own mind can come up with. So I was pulling on his arm and going, what, what? Now, my mum is actually epileptic and I saw her fits when I was a kid, so I thought it was happening to him too or something similar and I wouldn't know what to do because we're up on this huge cliff and no one is around. When just as fast as he started it, he snapped out of it fireman lifted me right up on his shoulder and just started striding away without a word. Over his shoulder though I could see a big yellow pale object stuck in the ground like a, an obelisk or something. I know now though that it was actually a refrigerator. But when I was older and I asked my dad about it too he just stiffened up and told me that when he was a boy in the 50s he and his little friends had found an old style fridge in the woods and being little boys they opened it. And well, of course, they had found a body. Another child who, by whichever means, had found themselves in the fridge and unable to get out. But my dad has never mentioned a gender, which leads me to believe that he either witnessed a very decomposed or skeletonized individual, but I can't ask him. Remember that episode of The Simpsons where they unlock Homer's PTSD and it turns out that he found a dead body when he was a teenager? Well, my dad grew increasingly uncomfortable the first time that he saw that episode and had excused himself to the kitchen before the ending. But my dad has seen some pretty gnarly shit in his life, but for whatever reason, he just will not discuss anything further about this dead child in the fridge, only that it happened. So when he explained, I assumed it was the trauma and I said something like, Oh, Dad, that's awful. So when you saw the fridge up there, it brought up all those old memories, right? And he honestly looked at me with his big blue eyes like I was an idiot. And I'll never forget what he said. No, Amy, he said in a very low tone. It was because it was the same fridge. So I have a few events that have happened throughout my childhood and a small amount throughout my adult life. I thought I'd share some with you as they've suddenly popped back into my mind. But the first story involved my brothers and sisters and our first real experience with something unusual. So I was about 8 or 9, I'm currently 22, and I was playing Cat in the Hat for the Xbox original. My sisters came home late around one or two, I think, and were hanging out with me and watching me play the game in my living room, but we only had one TV. And on the final level of the boss fight, my brother comes home drunk, also my mum worked nights at the time, so she was gone till 5am, and started to yell at us to shut up and go to sleep because he was tired. As we tried to explain to him the game was almost done, he kept getting louder and louder until finally the game and the TV shut off on their own and the kitchen light just went on full blast to 100% brightness. Our kitchen light switch was and still is a knob and it had about three full rotations to max brightness. My brother immediately shut up and left into the other family room and just sat there where as me and my sisters just looked at each other wondering what the hell happened. Nobody was near the light knob at the time and everyone was spooked as hell. After that night, strange stuff began to happen while I was home alone constantly as well. As I got older, my sisters and brothers began going out more at night to do stuff like partying and whatnot and I was still young and I would watch TV by myself until about midnight on weeknights. It would just be me and my dog watching Toonami, waiting for our favourite show to come on. The TV is in the main living room closer to the hallways with the bedrooms and the family room is near the front door and had our computer, a piano and an old coffee table. 
We still have that coffee table and piano, in fact. As I would be watching anime late at night by myself, I would hear footsteps in our attic at night. And I honestly thought that I was hallucinating, or maybe I was paranoid, but when my dog hears it too and begins to growl at my ceiling, you basically feel pretty fucked. I would shrug it off, like maybe it was a raccoon or a possum on the roof or something, but the shit got real when the computer monitor turned on by itself at 12am at night, and I began hearing the keys on the keyboard clicking. I knew that I was by myself too, because I made it a routine to check every room and make sure everything was okay and locked before I would go into my living room. I was self-conscious about my anime as a kid. Hearing keys click, I hid under my blanket and held my dog as he perked his ears up on alert of the sound. I went into the family room to investigate after I turned on all the lights in the house and all the windows were double locked with the button lock and the steel pole thing was in place as a failsafe. Also, my garage door and my front door were both double locked and chained. Nobody was there. The computer didn't turn on, it was just the monitor and the sound of the keys clicking and I quickly turned off the monitor and I just left at that point. When I turned 15, my mum switched to day shifts instead of night shifts so my schedule got tight. I was in bed by 8 and up by 7 and to be honest I kind of miss it. Fast forward though to now and I'm 22 and I'm still into gaming where I built my own PC and got a whole bunch of fancy stuff for it. I have a Corsair Strafe with Cherry MX Blues, yes, the really loud and clicky ones, and my gaming PC is in my room about four feet away from my bed as well, and one night, I was up late texting the bay around 1am and I swear to god that someone started clicking my fucking keyboard, and all those memories instantly came back, and I started crying as I turned on my phone flashlight to see if someone was in my room. My little brother likes to joke around and play pranks and whatnot, so I thought maybe he hid in my room or snuck in while I was just texting, but I didn't see anyone there. I got up to check under and around my bed and around my closet to see if I could find anything or anyone. But my bed doesn't have an under part because it's a two-piece with drawers under it anyway, but there's absolutely zero space under my bed and my closet is just a cut-out space in my room with a pole for hangers. In other words... There was just nowhere to hide except for on the side of the bed. After I calmed down, I opened my door to call my girlfriend and tell her what happened. She's horrified of supernatural things, so I kind of kept it brief. I keep her on the phone and close my door and shut off my light. I'm wide awake on the phone with her, and then I hear my spacebar key get pushed four times in rapid succession, like someone was mashing it. I ask my girlfriend if she heard it and I hold the phone closer to the desk and the space key clicks again. Obviously, I didn't sleep in my room that night. Every now and then I still hear stuff in my attic but it's full of fiber and shit and I don't like going up there. Plus, it's a huge pain in the ass. However, the times I do go up there, there isn't anything at all and it just really bothers me. I would honestly feel better if there was some old dude living up there who was just messing with me so that I could call the cops and get it sorted. But unfortunately, that's just not the case. I always leave my car unlocked. Always. No matter where it is, no matter what I'm doing, no matter how long I'll be, it's always unlocked. The reason for this is because I used to live in a really bad neighborhood, but there were always robberies and just break-ins and everything. Now, back then, I was a broke-ass college kid. I didn't have shit for anyone to steal. But I noticed that some people were getting their windows smashed in on their cars when people were breaking in. But when I asked around, they told me that the cars with the smashed windows were locked. And so, I left my car unlocked. If they wanted to waste their time looking through it, that's on them. I always kept my car unlocked and never kept any valuables in it. A few times, it was rummaged through for sure, but I always just cleaned the mess up and moved on. But fast forward to now though, and I had a closing shift at work uh, about a week ago I'd say. I'm a librarian, so I get off at about 9 during closing shifts. Not bad, and we all walk out and lock up together. 
There are two parking lots at my library, but one in the front where the books are and one in the back where the labs or computers are. Most employees park in the back, but this time I chose to park in the front. I said goodbye to everyone and headed to my car alone. But when I reached it, I grabbed the handle and pulled, but it wouldn't open. For a few seconds, I was really confused, but then it hit me. My doors were locked. Instantly, I was unsettled. I had the feeling that I was being watched. I don't know why, too. Maybe it was just the weirdness of knowing that I hadn't locked the door or something. I looked around, though, checked my back seat, unlocked it, and jumped in. I started it and tore out of the parking lot, and when I hit the main road home, there was traffic. It wasn't a lot, given the time, but it was still pretty slow and kept stopping. And I just could not shake this creeping feeling that I still had, but I just brushed it off. I reasoned with myself that I just watched too many horror movies. But then, as I stopped at a light, I heard a loud screech and a thump. My trunk had just come open. I waited until I got to a well-lit area to stop and I pulled into the parking lot of a gas station, shaking. I made sure that there were people around and practically tiptoed to my trunk. Nothing was in there, but a few of my things looked like they'd been moved to make a person-sized spot. After this, I think I might start locking my car after all. My friend had gotten a good deal on his first house, something like $100,000, which was really good for a small house. But as soon as he moved in, something was just off. He lived there with his girlfriend too. So the first encounter with the noises was when they were inside the house moving in. My friend was going up to the attic to store some extra stuff that wouldn't fit to pawn off later. As he was going up the ladder to the attic, he heard a scrambling noise. He went up there and just a terrible smell hit him, but it was a 20 year old house so he didn't think too much of it. After he went down though, he heard something again in the attic. He figured it was just a rodent and after a few weeks called an exterminator. The exterminator went up and found a bunch of cocaine, heroin, every drug you can think of just sitting there. He called the cops and they arrived to search the house. My friend was cuffed, the house was searched and the attic too and they found a pipe in the corner leading to a crawl space. They didn't have a crawl space that they knew of. The cops went back downstairs and searched the house. They eventually found nothing and my friend took it upon himself to break the base underneath the house and he found a living space with his stuff from the attic in it and a guy with long brown hair, a torn hoodie, and my friend's extra shoes. He yelled for the cops, still out front, and got their F out of there quickly. The cops wanted the man to put his gun down. He did. They told him to get in cuffs. He walked over to the hole my friend had broke and accepted his fate. He was charged with illegal drug trafficking and sentenced to a year in prison. It still creeps me out though, even though he moved the heck away from there a few months ago, to know that some drug dealer was hiding in his house for months, with a gun too. A few years ago, when I was 16 to 17, I worked in a restaurant as a waitress. There were two locations, one in my town, which we'll call Restaurant A, and one in a town about 30 minutes away, Restaurant B. I should mention too that Restaurant B is located in a, a rougher area and many of my co-workers weren't from the best of backgrounds. Nonetheless, they were sweet people and I honestly trusted them. I was trusted as a manager on Thursdays at Restaurant B, which usually meant that I was the cashier, server, manager, and the only other person would be a cook, which I'll call Dave. In the restaurant, there's a front glass door that customers use and a back wood door, but no window in the door, that we use to take out the trash and such. One day, we had no business, and I was in the kitchen with Dave and another cook that was about to leave. But we're standing around talking with Dave right in front of the back door and the other cook to the side of the door and me about five feet away from Dave in line with the door. He had a bag of trash in his hand and he was going to take it out. He opened the door while facing me and talking and behind the door was a person. It was clearly a person in a grey t-shirt, jeans and a black hat. 
I saw him for a split second, long enough to know that someone was definitely there, and then Dave saw my face and turned around, which blocked my view, and the guy was gone. But the other cook saw my face turn white as a sheet when David opened the door and joked that I looked like I had seen a ghost. And the irony was real. While Dave started looking around outside to see what I could have seen, I started actually panicking. I have severe anxiety and panic disorder, and Dave was trying to calm me down, but he also seemed really freaked out. He asked me what I had saw, and I told him that I saw some person. I described the person, and what he told me next will never leave me. Dave started crying and ran out the door with his phone in his hand. He was outside for nearly half an hour, and when he came back in, he was calmer but still nervous. He told me that roughly 10 years ago, he and his friend were in a horrible car accident which ended with his friend dying. He told me that the person I described standing outside of the door was wearing the exact outfit that his friend had died in. And apparently, I wasn't the first person to see the ghost of his friend. Dave told me that whenever something were to happen to anyone in his family, his friend would show up to either him or his family. For example... But one time he saw the ghost of his friend and literally a minute later, his phone rang and he found out that his father had just suffered a massive heart attack. When he had went out of the door, he was calling his family to make sure that everyone was okay. Luckily, they were, but not even two days later, he found out that his wife had a miscarriage. And as if that wasn't weird enough, the same night, I saw the ghost again and something else weird happened that I believe was paranormal, but I also understand could have been just paranoia. So I was up at the front of the register, still shaken up, and a huge crow was hovering outside of the front door. It was weird because it was literally just kind of flying in place. It suddenly flew away and then a really strange looking man approached the door, opened it wide, but didn't enter. He had the creepiest smile on his face the entire time, and moments later, the crow was back and it almost came into the restaurant, but another customer swatted it away. The man literally just turned around, left, didn't order anything, and didn't say a word to anyone. I know it kind of sounds all a bit weird and kind of out there, but I'm just hoping someone reads this and understands that what I went through is real because everyone I know doesn't believe in the paranormal and thinks that I was just imagining things, but I know that I wasn't. When I was 13, I had this girlfriend who I'd played hockey with for years. She has a little frame, very thin, tomboyish too, always got called a boy because of her style, and I slept over at her house during the summer a few times. But we're both pretty short, and she has brothers, older and younger. I was wearing a pink hoodie, and she was wearing a backwards cap. So, I'm sleeping over at a house in this fancy suburban neighborhood. Big houses, everyone has a pool, but not fancy enough where you need to get buzzed in or anything. We're outside, it's the morning, and she's teaching me how to skateboard. But we always had this dumb joke where we butt scooted, where we sat on the skateboards and rolled down her road, which was just a big hill. But we were doing this when we noticed a car pulling down behind us, so we got up and walked back to a house on the sidewalk. Girlfriend makes a comment about not recognizing the car and whatever. But we're messing around in a driveway when we notice the car very slowly pulling up a bit in front of a driveway by the neighbor's house. This means that they must have gone to the bottom of the cul-de-sac, turned around and driven back up. But the man in the driver's seat gestures towards us and nods. The woman in the passenger seat gets out of the car and starts walking towards us. I'm from a poorer neighborhood and not easily frightened. I didn't find anything suspicious here in this nice neighborhood, so I started walking toward her and the girlfriend grabs my wrist. Wait, no. Get in the garage now. What? This lady is just lost or something, I thought. But upon hearing my girlfriend loudly say to get in the garage, the strange lady raps on her window and yells something at the man. Girlfriend and I run into the garage. The lady rushes up the driveway. A little boy, little girl, come here, she says. We grab some sort of sticks for weaponry. Garage closes and we run inside. We watch through the window. The lady gets into the car and just zooms away. 
Of course, nobody else is there. Her dad is at work, mum with brothers at practice, and we watch them pull into the neighbourhood again and stop in front of the house. Twice. Looking back on this, I'm terrified to think about what could have happened if my girlfriend didn't make us go into the house. We kept track of every car we didn't recognise after that, and we were much more careful from that point on. So this is, to this day, my strongest paranormal experience and although I believe it can be rationally explained because I was three years old at the time, on the other hand, I remember the event very clearly and it feels very real every time I think about it. So as a kid, I used to wake up in the middle of the night a lot, take my blanket and go to my parents' bed. This night was no different. I woke up, got out of bed and left the blanket half hanging from the bed so that I could just take it with me easily. I opened the door out of my bedroom and then I accidentally fell on the ground. The weird thing though was that I felt like something was holding both of my ankles. So I flipped on my back to see what was holding me and that was when I saw it. The thing was completely dark, but thanks to the streetlight, I could just see its shape. It resembled a human, but I knew immediately that it definitely was not a human figure. I could see its dark arms, which were unbelievably long, stretching through the whole room and holding my ankles. The creature was really tall, something around two and a half meters, or 8.3 feet or something. The creature also had a head, pitch black as the rest of the body. However, I could very clearly see two glowing red dots that I suppose were eyes, but I'm not too sure. I felt relatively calm, which was weird, until I looked in the eyes. And that was when the creature started pulling me. I grabbed the door frame and the sill and tried to pull myself out of the room. It was difficult, but thankfully the creature's pulling wasn't too strong. It eventually stopped holding me, so I managed to get on my feet and close the door. The next morning, I woke up in my parents' bed. I went to my room. The creature obviously wasn't there, but the blanket was in the same place that I left it. Since then, I was expecting it to return at some point, but it never appeared again. Now, I'm not saying that this is all real. It could very well just be my childhood imagination, but... Like I said, every time I think about it, the night just feels very, very real. So at the time, I was around six and in Ireland, I would be in senior infant school, I think. I think first grade in America, but I could be wrong. But I remember this day well, and while some things are a little blurry as it happened about 12 years ago... I can remember most of it pretty well. The school had just finished for the day and I was waiting for my parents to come and pick me up. Both of them work, so I was used to waiting for them. I was waiting about some 10 minutes, I'd say, outside the school gates and out of nowhere, this huge woman came up to me and grabbed my arm, insisting that she was a friend of my mother's and said something along the lines of, I know where your mother is. Being a dumb child, I believed her and followed her. She guided me up to the church directly beside my school. Her car was in the parking lot of the church. She opened the car door and threw me in. This obviously hurt and I was confused as to why my mother's friend would hurt me like that. It was at this point that I knew that something was wrong. She also didn't get into the car but locked the door and waited outside of the car, looking around as if she was waiting for someone. I thought of all the stranger danger warnings I was taught as a child at this point. I began to cry and try to open the door, but of course, nothing happened. I remember looking down at my Winnie the Pooh backpack and my eyes being blurry with tears. And the next thing I knew, I heard arguing from outside the car and I looked to my left. And there was my best friend's mother shouting at this woman to let me go and threatening to call the guards or the police if she didn't. I heard the woman saying that I was her daughter and she wouldn't let me go. Looking back on this part, I actually laugh a bit because I was a very pale white child and this woman was black, so I'm not sure how her argument could have made any sense in her own head. After a lot of shouting though, the woman unlocked the door and let me go, I assume because I was too much hassle. I was in tears and I just ran away and I saw my mother and ran. 
My mother asked the woman what happened, and this woman flat out lies to my mother and my friend's mother, saying that she was told to pick me up from school by a friend, then got in her car and just left. But one of the worst parts about it is my mum actually believed her, and to this day insists that this incident never happened, even though my friend and his mother remembered it, so it definitely couldn't be a dream. I don't know what would have happened to me or who this woman was waiting for after she locked me in the car, but I'm very grateful for my friend's mother as I could definitely owe her my life. When I was 16, I became a dementia care worker, making me one of the youngest in the country doing so. I came from Scotland and the legal age of adulthood here is 16, so working more adult jobs at that age isn't really that uncommon. Unlike more care homes though, the one that I worked in was actually a renovated mansion. It was originally a regular care home, but by some strange decision it was decided that it would take dementia patients too, which was honestly a pretty horrible choice. The regular doorways, for instance, could hardly fit our equipment, and there was basically no room for the things that we had to do in bedrooms for some patients. It was honestly the worst place that could have housed those kinds of patients, but that was really only the beginning of everyone's worries. Everyone who worked in this home, old or young, would all vow that the place was just undoubtedly haunted. Now, usually when it comes to haunted places, there are at least some skeptics, but not here, which was odd. The place was just so active, even veteran doctors in the 40s and 50s couldn't deny the strange things that happened there, which I think says a lot about how active the building actually was. The thing that was spoken of the most, and seen the most too, was the children. It's historical fact that two young children died in the home many years ago, I think around the late 1800s, of some kind of sickness when the mansion was still a family home. To my knowledge, the family didn't go on to have any more children and moved out soon after. Honestly, when I heard this story, I kind of just sort of shrugged it off because it was like any Victorian era sob story. But it was definitely a bit different when I started to come face to face with it all. But my first experiences were pretty gentle and things I easily explained away, although I must admit that I did believe in the paranormal. Things like uh, door slamming, footsteps, the feeling that someone was just behind you, etc. Regular spooky things that most haunted homes have, or at least you hear about. And that was until the buzzers began to go wild. In this specific home, we all wore pages on our belts that were hooked onto an alarm system of buttons and pressurized mats all around the home, so if a patient pressed a button or fell onto their mats, we could immediately be alerted and could run to their aid. It was an okay system, but the mats were basically all in the wrong order, causing the pager to say room 6, but it was really room 12. It was honestly a nightmare to keep track of. And my first time around a patient's death is when I experienced the issues with the buzzers. Every time a patient got near death, the buzzers would just go absolutely haywire. I mean, our pages would be sending the alarm non-stop all around the house, literally leading workers on wild goose chases as they continuously went off one after another constantly. It sounds fake, I know, but that's truly how we knew that a patient was going to die every time. It was like a, a warning of some kind almost. And when they died, I kid you not, every time their buzzers would continue to go off for a few days before they just stopped. It was normal to me eventually when I worked there, but looking back, I can't believe how unbelievably spooky of a thing that was. Anyway, a lot of other weird things happened in that place. Like I said, everyone just kind of accepted that the place was haunted, but these incidences have always just kind of stuck with me. In mid-July of 2017, me and my best friend, John, went for a road trip into another town to visit my good friend and colleague, Chris. We stayed for two nights, but the second one was the one which I'll remember to the day that I die. So, I'd like to begin with the place that we rested our eyes. It was a really old house, but Chris told me that it was probably 150 plus years old and it was his heritage from his aunt. 
No one lived there, but nevertheless, he would throw some mini-parties rarely in the past, but nothing too special. The house itself was constructed in the 1800s, during the Ottoman era, but the really scary part was that it had a secret room when families would hide from the Ottomans' cruelty. However, me and John didn't know where it was, and we didn't even want to know, if I'm being honest. So, the night came in all of her glory. It started as a completely normal hangout. We were laughing, drinking, and just having some fun. The time's about 12pm, time to get some rest for tomorrow's adventures. Chris went to sleep in a separate room. Me and John were having the late night chats just before bedtime, when we noticed in John's room, just above his pillow, a really old fresco of St. Mary. John took his phone out, snapped a photo, and that's when we knew that we were screwed, because the photo was completely blurry. Well, we were just standing in awe for a minute, realizing what the hell just happened, but some time later, we went to our beds in separate rooms. I couldn't shut my eyes for 15 minutes because I was completely terrified. And then, I heard three really loud knocks coming from John's room. I thought that John was messing with me at first and went to his room to see what was going on, but I saw John completely frightened in the hallway. He apparently went to my room for the same reasons. But we were both shocked and he came to my room, and after approximately 20 minutes of talking and trying to forget everything... We heard really intense stepping sounds from the hallway, but we were so convinced that there was a thief in the house that we started shouting and stomping in the hallway ready to fight. But when we got there, there was nothing, just darkness and silence. My bones were shaking and my heart was pumping. I could feel my blood in my veins. Very slowly and carefully, we checked all four rooms in the house, and again, nothing, just blank. We obviously checked Chris too, but he was in a deep sleep. Fifteen minutes later though, we heard the same steps approaching our room again. But we were really frightened because we just couldn't tell what was real and what was fantasy. And at this point, I just wanted the night to end. But the same things happened four times throughout the night, hearing steps, searching for the intruder to just come up with nothing and repeat. But the interesting part though is that every time we searched, we couldn't hear a damn sound. Everything was just completely silent, like eerily silent. But as soon as we got in our bed, the steps were there again. This whole event lasted for a few hours from about midnight to 7am in the morning. And those were some of the longest hours in my entire life. The next morning we told everything to Chris and he laughed a lot and thought that we were just lying to him. But when we told him from which room we heard the first three kicks... He got scared even more than us because apparently the secret room was just under John's bed, hidden by carpet. And I must admit that when I heard this, I just got goosebumps all over my body. And I could not wait to get away from that place. I was baptized May 20th of 2018 by my cousin, who is a Methodist preacher. At the time, she was a preacher at a church outside of Wildwood, New Jersey. Even though my mum and I don't live in New Jersey, we decided to join the church anyway since it was only a couple of hours driving distance. With me were my mum and my dad. The ride up there was fine and we took the same route we always take. I can't tell you the highway names or the numbers or even town names because I've always been bad at remembering stuff like that. But what I can tell you is that the ride back was really messed up. So we got on a stretch of highway that we'd been on numerous times before. My mum knows the way to and from Wildwood by heart but always has Google Maps up on her phone as backup just in case. And as we went along, things just got really weird. It wasn't something that I could put my finger on right off the bat, but there was this really intense feeling of just unease in the environment around us. Eventually, I realized just how quiet it was, and my dad talked from time to time, but when he was silent, the whole world was silent too. Even the car engine was eerily silent. After a while, I realized that the highway and the trees around us had stopped looking normal, the highway itself was just a straight road for miles and miles ahead of us. No signs, no bends, no curves, no exits, no place to make a U-turn, and no buildings off in the distance. 
The sky and the trees, too, they look grey. But not a rainy day kind of grey, just a nearly colourless grey. I looked over at my mum's phone, which still had maps up, and realised that we were being directed to make a U-turn at some unseen turn off. Looking at maps, there was nothing around us. Just one long straight highway. The last thing that I realised was the lack of any other cars, too. But for the past 15 minutes or so, there hadn't been a single car on the desolate, pin-straight highway. And just as I noticed that, mum and dad both realised that something was very wrong. Mum said that she must have missed the exit. Dad said that he hadn't seen a single exit for the longest time. I mentioned how the annoying robot chick from the maps hadn't spoken a word in forever. And... That's what really set the tone for my mum, since that robot voice was something of a running joke with us. We sat in a very uncomfortable silence for a few more minutes until finally we saw a car. Then another and another and signs started reappearing and we found a place to turn around and eventually found our exits. Even the colour came back to the world around us, which was so strange. I've tried talking about this with my parents a few times since it happened. My mum never adds anything to the conversation. Sometimes it seems like she's just highly disturbed by it. My dad and I talked about it once though, which made him really uncomfortable. And nowadays, he just changes the conversation to something else when I try. I've come to the conclusion that us realising that something was wrong is probably what snapped us back into our reality. If we hadn't, how long would we have been on that highway? That's anyone's guess, I suppose. Would it have gone on forever with us blissfully oblivious to the surreal world that we somehow slipped into? But my biggest fear is that there was something at the end of that highway, and if we had made it to the end, there would have been no coming back. But rethinking what I just told you guys, I realized that there's no real way to capture the eeriness and the dread that we felt in that moment. I guess the best thing to compare this to is the sudden silence that people associated with the missing 411. If anyone has had a similar experience though, or has heard of one, please let me know because I would like to know more. I'm still very disturbed by what happened and it's been over a year since we went back to New Jersey and I know that we're due for another trip very soon with a family reunion on the way and honestly, I'm pretty afraid that it will happen again. So, I saw a thing in or near the woods on three separate occasions now. Each time I saw this thing, it was in a different state along the east coast of America, and each time the sighting was just fleeting. I'm in my 30s now, and the sightings have several years between them. The first time I saw it was in high school, and this is most definitely the time that I got the longest look at it. The second time, I only caught a glimpse, and I'm pretty sure, but not entirely sure, that it was the same thing. The third time, I got a clear look at it from a distance, but it caught me so off guard that I stumbled as I was taking a step and I lost sight of it. I've been calling it a thing because I have no idea what it is, and quite honestly, I don't even have a good guess either. It was not a Sasquatch, a wild man, a rake, a lizard person, or any other creature that I found through my incredibly frustrating recent internet research on the subject matter. But maybe a, a shapeshifter of some kind, because the first time I saw it, the thing changed its form for sure. Yes, I said that it changed its form. If you're someone like me that relies on science for validation, then please try to keep an open mind, but I know that you also tend to explain away people's paranormal encounters for any number of different reasons. Heck, I did the same. Also, I would have expected that if I ever did end up seeing something otherworldly, it might be something that someone else had seen before, right? I might see something that I recognize from television or movies, and I might say, look up there, that's a UFO, or holy crap, that's a ghost. Maybe it's Bigfoot. But this thing, though, this thing was just so surreal and so deranged, I'm really at a loss. This post is the first time that I've put out any of this to anyone, and if it weren't for this last encounter, then I would have forgotten the first two again. I've never mentioned this to anyone because of just how ridiculous it sounds, I know. The fact that I have no proof and the fact that I'm a known fuck about, I'm pretty much exactly the person that you might think would make something like this up. At this point though, 
I only want to get this off my chest to hopefully find out if anyone else has ever seen this thing. But before I begin telling you what happened, I would like to make it clear that I swear what you're about to hear is the truth about what I saw as best as I can remember anyway. If you don't believe, that's fine. Whatever, I get that. But this is the reason I'm posting what happened here, and it's also the reason that I have never, and will never, tell anyone I might have to see in my daily life. I'm sure that they would think that I'm crazy or just desperate for attention because what I saw is just downright absurd. And well, now that I've thoroughly destroyed any credibility I may have once had, I'll tell you guys what I saw as best as I can. I have been thinking a lot about exactly how I might explain this to someone a while now, so I'll do my best to keep out of narrative tone. And so, I'll attempt to explain the details about what I saw as bluntly as possible with as vivid of a recollection as I have of the events. So, the first sighting was in southern New Hampshire, 2000 or 2001, summer probably, I don't remember exactly when, but well after midnight. So, I'm going to take some time to explain this first encounter in as much detail as I can recall, even though it all happened so fast, literally lasting in a total of maybe 10 seconds. It's still the longest amount of time, though, that I've spent truly looking at this thing. So, I was walking to a friend's house from the apartment complex that I lived in late at night. But to get from one place to the other quickly, you had to cut through a small patch of forest, roughly 100 yards, that was technically somebody else's property. A couple of times before, we had someone shine a light on us, and once he fired a shot in the air to try and scare us in an attempt to get us to stop cutting through there. It never did stop us, but it was a good attempt, I must admit. It did, however, teach me to be stealthier when cutting through, and so, on this night, I was creeping very quietly through the trees as I went. The forest was in a valley between my apartment complex, some houses, and the neighborhood where my friend lived. The valley dipped down into the middle with a steep incline surrounding it and so at first I had to go down into the valley and then at the end I would walk up out of the valley exiting the tree line right onto the street where this house is. Once exiting the tree line one would be standing on the side of the street with the end of the road about uh, half a mile to your right I'd say and the entrance to the neighborhood about the same distance on the left. The houses were spaced apart decently, so the night was very dark except for the area around the houses and a couple of light circles under the orange streetlights, of which there were very few for the amount of space. So I got through the valley with no problem this time, and I got up some speed to go up the hill in front of me where the forest ended, maybe five feet from the edge of the street, if even that far. And at the exact moment that I came out of the tree line and onto the edge of the road, Something caught my eye to the left of me, emerging from the woods across the street. It stumbled awkwardly out of the dark woods and into view right at the edge of the circle of the orange light radiating down from one of the street lights. At first, and for just a brief moment, it looked like a shadow. However, I heard a sound coming from the dead leaves beneath its feet and I quickly realized that it was definitely not a shadow. Its body shape was like that of a starving child maybe three feet tall that you might see in a third world country but its legs and arms were so thin that there appeared to be no way that it could support the creature's body weight it was dark but from what i can remember at the end of its frail looking limbs were just nubs no hands and no feet that i could see its movements though were the creepiest part honestly and they were the first thing that threw me off I can't even really explain just how absurd and unnatural its movements were or how it was standing on those tiny legs. It moved forward from the trees and toward the street extremely awkwardly with a couple of steps that I saw it take. It moved forward from the trees and toward the street extremely awkwardly with a couple of steps that I saw it take. It was almost as if it was not supposed to be walking around like that, but it had somehow figured out a way to do it regardless. The thing was roughly two or three feet tall with an enlarged light bulb shaped head and a little belly in spite of how thin the rest of its frame was. In addition to its shape and motion, the thing seemed unreal and mostly because it didn't seem to reflect any light at all when it stepped into the light of the street lamp. It appeared to have no three-dimensional form at all with its body, almost blending right into its shadow and I could only really tell that it had a solid form by the way it moved and navigated the environment around it. I froze in place instantly when I saw it, with my brain unable to even process what I was seeing. 
In a couple of steps, it exited the trees, stumbled across the patch of grass to the street, and then just sort of fumbled down forward toward a sewer drain on the side of the road. I'm not sure what I did, if I did anything at all, but as soon as it hit that curb, it rose back up and looked over at me. I couldn't see its face or anything at all, still just this bizarre black shape moving so unbelievably awkwardly. I really can't stress this enough too, its movements were just ridiculously uncoordinated. But what happened next is what sent me fleeing into the woods with all of the cowardice that has kept me alive to this day. Upon seeing me, this malformed shadow child thing did this quick twisted turn toward me, dropping down on all fours and becoming a much more animal-like shape when it did. I, again, have no idea how to describe the motion as it was just so unnatural, but when its turn was complete, the thing had become something I can only describe as a shadow dog or cat or bear or something. I know that that sounds crazy, but I can't describe it any other way than that. It stood on all fours like a predatory animal, but I just couldn't make out any definition on it with the way it didn't catch the light that it was standing directly below. This thing, it didn't just go from being human-like to being a human on all fours. I mean, it genuinely became something else as far as I could tell. I also debated leaving this next part out because, well, it just slices into the credibility of the events even further, but it did happen, so here it goes. As soon as the creature had hit all fours and was no longer humanoid, its eyes flashed yellow at me, and then it let out a shriek or a growl, but... It wasn't quite a growl or a bark or a snarl, not an animal-like roar either, or even a hissing, but a legitimate shriek that sounded like neither a person nor quite an animal. The sound started quiet too and then rose quickly, almost as if it was winding up or under pressure and just painfully being forced out of the creature's mouth at great anguish. Its scream had a certain harshness to it as if it might have had something seriously wrong with its vocal cords or it had just smoked a million cigarettes consecutively. I remember the thing had a weird, almost scared vulnerability to the sound it made, which contrasted the harshness in the tone as well as the defensive stance the creature took. All of this took place in just a few seconds too, maybe ten at most, from the time the thing exited the tree line to the time it turned, postured and shrieked at me, and sent me running without a single thought in my head right back into the woods. Now, I did not stop and I did not look back, I didn't try to be quiet through the forest, I just ran as fast as I could. And that is definitely correct. I was so scared that I ran into the dark, scary woods to get away, only realizing how dumb that was sometime afterward. The sound it made chilled me to my core then, but now in hindsight, I think the flashing eyes bother me more than the sound because it seemed so expected. The flashing or glowing eyes trope is precisely what I've heard in so many other people's stories that I've never believed about mysterious creatures they claim to have encountered. I mean, because that is what scary things in the night do, right? They flash yellow eyes and make scary shrieking sounds at you, obviously. What else would they do, right? I never made it to my friend's house that night, though, and I never mentioned this to anyone ever since. In fact, I even managed to forget about this experience pretty quickly, although I'm not quite sure how because my life was high drama at the time, so I'm sure it's because I did something stupid that took over my world. Either way, this was not the last time that I would see it. The second sighting was in central Florida, 2006 in spring I believe, early at night at about 8pm. The second sighting is much briefer and as I mentioned before, I'm 90% sure it was the same thing but I'm not entirely sure. I'll keep this short though and tell you simply that I was out camping, went for a walk along a trail and was watching my girlfriend hop from rock to rock across the river. I heard a sound to my left and when I turned to look... I saw an extremely thin skinny black nub leg, or possibly a tail, I don't know, disappear behind a tree as if it was an animal running away from something. I ran over this time, determined to see what it was, but I found nothing and I didn't mention it to my girlfriend. No experiences or weird sounds that night either and no more encounters for several years. The third sighting was eastern shore of Virginia, June 8th, 2019, late at night at about 11pm. So finally, 
Here's the reason I felt that I had to put this out there and the reason I'm so freaked out by this thing. It's not so much what happened last week as it was just another quick glimpse and nothing else, but instead it's the fact that it happened again to me and, as far as I know, nobody else. So last week I was at a party at a friend's house, celebrating her birthday because she's one of those people in their 30s that still gets excited about those things. I don't drink, so I wasn't drunk, but in the interest of total transparency, I've been known to partake in the occasional uh, medicinal herb supplement for recreational purposes. You can take that information however you like, but my friend lives with her husband in a farmhouse surrounded by open fields for a couple of acres in any direction, surrounded of course by a thick forest. I had been there for a while at this point, and the thing was honestly the furthest thing from my mind at the time. But we were all just hanging out and rambling on about the usual and ain't bullshit. I decided that I wanted to smoke, so I went at the front door and onto the porch. I stepped forward and went to step down the front steps to get a little more space. And as I did, I glanced up out into the field in front of the house. And there it was, roughly 50 yards out and bumbling through the field toward the trees. For a split second, I could see the unmistakable shape of this weird shadow child thing. It was just the same as before. Large head and belly, unbelievably thin arms and legs, and again reflecting absolutely no light at all. I was mid-step when I glanced up and lost track of where I was stepping, causing me to fall forward. I managed to catch myself as I fell barely, and I must have made a sound when I did because when I looked back up, the thing was on all fours, quickly running like a dog off into the woods. I want to reiterate too that this thing did not move on all fours like a person in any way, but it moved more like an animal with knees bent backward or something. I was too far away and it happened too fast for me to tell if it had hands and feet this time. I started to walk out and look around a bit when somebody else came outside and not wanting to tell anyone, I just went back to the party. I must have been distant the rest of the night because I just couldn't get it out of my head this time. I ended up leaving the party relatively early and went home to start obsessing about it as I have been for about a week now. So, obviously, I'm sufficiently freaked out by a lot of things about what I've seen. Even discounting the second sighting, I got two brief but very good looks at something that, honestly, I just cannot explain. And one of the things that bothers me most about this is, why me? Why, as far as I know, have... I've been the only one to see this thing. If it knows of me and is following me or something like that, then why does it seem surprised by my presence each time that I've seen it and then enter a sort of final flight mentality? If it doesn't know of me, then why am I the only one to see this thing and now in three different states years apart? I just have so many questions. I've been writing this over a few days to make sure I have got all the details as best as I can remember and I hope that I'm not the only one that saw this creepy little fucker. What I saw that night was so unnatural. I never expected to see anything like that in my life and it honestly just did not belong in our physical reality and it almost did not even seem to fit in the environment around it as if it's something 2D superimposed into an authentic 3D background. I have looked into shadow people videos and sightings, but I just don't think that this is what that was, as there was nothing ghostly about what I saw, it was just there and had a solid form. This thing was just so out of place, but at the same time, I definitely saw it there and heard it as well. And quite honestly, I really don't know what else to say about it. Each time, except the second, I could see enough of it too that I could tell it was not somebody messing with me and I could see enough of it to say that it did not belong here in this world with us. My best guess at this point is that it and I have crossed each other's paths in a possible interdimensional rift or time slip, only because of how surreal the experience was though, and trust me, I know how crazy that sounds. But... It's all I've come up with to rationalize the fact that this thing did not fit into its surroundings in just any way. It didn't even look like it was made to move and get around in this world. I mean, the force of gravity should have for sure crushed its skinny legs under the weight of its body. It was like an eggplant on toothpicks almost. Anyway, that's all there is for me to tell you guys, but I sincerely hope someone else saw something like this so that I know that I'm not starting to lose it. 
At this point, I only want to know that I'm not alone and that what I saw has some sort of explanation, rational or not, because I don't even care. Just give me something to go on at this point. All I need is one reasonable answer from somewhere at this point because I know what I saw and I can't get the way this thing moved or how dark it was out of my head. When I, 22 and female, was a college freshman four years ago, I just had some really scary paranormal experiences that I'd like to share with you guys. For weeks I was having these just horrible nightmares. I had a room at the time and my bed was against the left side of my room, my roommate's bed was against the right side of the room and there was a mini fridge in between the beds that we used as a sort of bedside table of sorts. The beds were high off the ground because we had storage underneath. Not as high as bunk beds, but definitely high enough that we had to jump to get into them. So one night, during this series of nightmares, I was in a deep sleep. I remember being stirred awake for no reason, but my eyes were still closed. I was laying on my right side, facing the middle of the room. I was barely conscious, but I remember feeling the sensation of my covers being tugged and my body moving along with them, and my right arm was outstretched. The next thing I know too, I wake up to the literal dead weight of my head slamming against the mini fridge. I immediately jumped into my roommate's bed asking help me, help me, and my right ear was ringing and behind my right ear was gushing blood. I'm 22 years old now and this was the only time that I've ever fallen out of bed. If I had rolled out of bed, wouldn't I have landed face down or on my left side? But I landed on my right side, which was the side I was sleeping on, which leads me to believe that I was actually pulled. The bedside table wasn't directly next to my bed either. It was equally between my roommate's and I's bed at a decent distance. Also, the angle at which I hit my head was just so obscure. The impact of the mini fridge hit the backside of my right ear and I wish that I could post the picture to just show the severity of the injury. I almost had to get stitches in fact and it was a very difficult area to bandage. It was just so strange and what do you guys think? So in my late teens I had this friend Felix. Unlike my social anxiety ridden self he was a social butterfly and appeared to know everyone. As such, I ended up knowing a lot of people by proxy and hung out with some interesting folk. But the one I'm going to talk about below is named Carly, and I'm not 100% convinced, but she might be a real ass witch. So I was at Felix's place one night with a few people, and we're all playing a game of Risk. We had smoked a bit and got to talking about some weird topics, compounded by the fact that we were weird teens. You know, the usual. My buddy had crazy stories about getting stuck in a radio tower, another friend had stories about getting locked in a basement all night, and I had my ghost stories, and it was one of the few times that people believed me, so that was nice. Carly had one that we actually called bullcrap on the most. But Carly was your typical kind of edgy goth girl, complete with clothes that would put a stripper to shame and enough makeup that it had a noticeable thickness. She was hot, I'll admit that, but we were distant friends and I had hung out with her a few times with Felix. She seemed nice enough, if a bit emotionally reserved, but apart from that she was okay. Well, this one night, she up and states that she has an energy vampire. I had no idea what that was as I didn't really have access to a lot of internet in rural Newfoundland. But she goes on to say that she gets energy from people's emotions. She can allegedly feel people's auras and she can detect when people have issues and she has to keep her emotions in check because she can get powerful. Whatever that means, right? But me and Felix call bullshit obviously as we had never seen her be powerful and those kind of claims just reek of fake coming from the edgy goth kid. She goes on and does a reading where she's able to tell me about my emotions. I remember she rightly said that I was depressed, but that isn't much of a shocker to anyone who met teen me, and told Felix that he had a grave injury impending. His mum did have a stroke like a year later for what little that might be worth. She also said though some other vague things to the rest of the people that we were hanging out with, which were probably correct, but I couldn't confirm. 
Finally though, after this had gone on for like an hour or so, I called her bluff. I asked her where did she get this mystical power and I remember asking her if her dad was a warlock and her mum a pixie. She says that she was taught by Mother Hilda and that was the most bullshit name that I had ever heard and I said, oh yeah, where the hell does she live? Up your ass? Becoming visibly distressed, she said to me and Felix, who was laughing his ass off, mind you, that she could bring me to her next weekend. We're thinking that she would bring me to one of her weird goth friends, who would try some edgy crap and always down for a laugh. I, of course, said yes. Felix was down as well, and so it was settled. Now, it's important to know that I have an issue with being a passenger in cars. I fall asleep almost immediately when not driving, a holdover from long car trips with the family. I mean, I fall asleep immediately, and if I can make it five minutes, it's pretty much a miracle. It's really important to remember this because I sure as shit wish it wasn't the case. So when the weekend comes, me, Felix, and Carly all get together to go meet this person. I had assumed that it would be some person that we would meet in the basement of their parents' house, but Carly says that Mother Hilda lives on the Bonavista Peninsula. That's a good three-hour drive in good weather from where I lived, and I was frankly more pissed off that she didn't bring snacks. So we all got in her car, and she had gotten her license already since she was six months older than us, and we set off. In my true fashion, I fell asleep within minutes and I don't think we even hit the highway before I was out. And when I had woken up, we were driving on a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. But for those of you who haven't been to Newfoundland, I think my wife put the Bonavista Peninsula best. It's like you're walking on graves of just millions of really pissed off goats. With gloomy skies, gloomy landscapes and a real feeling that something is watching you from the tree line where you just can't see them. I frankly hate the place. Most people I know from it are great, but everyone I know who lives on it is just miserable. So I came to, like I said, and we were driving down this poor excuse for a road and what could be more aptly named a goat path, I suppose. I immediately start complaining, where the hell are we? Why are we here? What are you planning? You know, just reasonable questions. But to all of the questions she answered, Mother Hilda will answer like a psychopath. Felix doesn't say a word and just kind of looks mildly amused. So after what felt like forever, we come to find some kind of clearing. It's really just a place where the trees aren't that big, and in the middle sat an old school Newfoundland box house in absolutely horrible condition, like no one had shown this house a lick of love in like a hundred years run down. It still had windows given, but the roof looked like it was attempting to threaten the ground with its lean. I remember the place was blue and the goat path didn't reach all the way up to it. It stopped about 100 feet shy, because of course it did. But Carly stops the car, gets out, and again like a psychopath, says, Mother Hilda will answer. I looked at Felix, who has the biggest grin on his face. He's high as a kite, and I berate him as this shit is fucking horrifying, and his only real response getting out of the car is, you're a better man than me for doing this sober. So I get out of the car with Felix, who insists I go first. My only thought is, why am I being the one murdered? Carly walks through the trees with her arms outstretched in a T-pose of sort, spinning and singing, Mother Hilda knows all. Felix looks at me and says, we're getting fucking murdered, aren't we? Carly reaches the door, opens it, and motions for us to come in. Now, I saw two options at this point. Either go in with the witchy woman, or brave the untamed wilderness of rural Newfoundland in God knows where. I eventually reach the door, though, and the place is just pitch black inside. It was a generally overcast day outside, and the windows must have been covered with paper or something. It wasn't freaking furnished, no lighting, just rotting boards and the smell of my impending doom if I'm being honest. I can hear Carly laughing upstairs because of course there's an upstairs. So I think, yep, I'm gonna die here. This is a murder house for her weird rituals or something. I can tell Felix is thinking the same thing but insists that I go first. Thankfully, the stairs were next to the front door, so I didn't have to risk walking through that creepy place. But when I look up the stairs, I nearly pissed myself. 
At the top is a girl, butt-ass naked and pointing down the upstairs hallway. She has makeup like Carly, thick and dark, and is staring at us with intent, possibly murderous. I turn to look back at Felix when the girl at the top of the stairs belts out in a voice louder than I'd peg her to have. Mother Hilda doesn't wait. So, petrified, I walk up those stairs. The place was eerily silent too. It was weird. I hadn't really noticed it before, but there was just no sound of the wind in the trees, no birds chirping, no rustling and no floorboard creaking, nothing. I started to really get those murder vibes on strong, but Felix flashed me a hunting knife that he brought along and whispered, I got you, we're leaving alive. Feeling like 0% better, I reached the top of the stairs and the girl who was maybe 14 I suppose, ran into a room on the upper floor and I saw Carly at the end of the hall next to a door, or what I assumed to be a closet. She had the biggest grin on her face too. But like a proud child about to show her mum a, a Play-Doh figure or something like that that she'd worked on all day. I walked closer and, with all the manly gusto that I had in me, made it five steps into the hallway. I had the feeling that I was going to puke and every fibre in my being was telling me that whatever was behind that door was danger, pure danger. Carly looked at me and said, Mother Hilda will see you, and opened that door. And what was inside was, I believe, to be a, a small child. Its back turned to me and eating something in the closet. I remember seeing what looked like chicken bones at its feet, which were huge, by the way. It was wearing a ratty, ratty shawl and was butt-ass naked below the waist. And that's when I noticed that it wasn't a kid. It was a really small old person. It had that typical saggy old person ass and the one that lacks all tone and definition. I watched this thing turn around and it was honestly the scariest sight of my life. It was definitely some kind of old woman but I question that frequently given its appearance. It had just tiny, tiny arms like an infant on a toddler's body that was holding a shawl up. It had wispy angelic strands barely holding onto its head and a noticeable hump on its back. I assume that I had noticed this because its face just didn't make sense. It was teeth, just kind of like one big mouth with hundreds of misshapen teeth. The entire face looked like it had been scooped out and just given teeth, rows upon rows of teeth. I saw no eyes, no nose, no forehead, just long creepy teeth. It snarled and yelled, no men, and at that point, I just passed out. When I woke up, I was back in Felix's house, him already up and staring at the floor with a thousand yard stare. I asked him if I had some kind of weird dream, and without missing a beat, he says, Nah man, Mother Hilda is real. I thought it was a creepy fake thing, but dude, I saw it too. We talked for about 30 minutes after that about what happened and we had basically the same recollection of the events, except Felix saw her move a step or two before he blacked out as well. Eventually I said that I should go home and he said that I should leave and we both just went our separate ways. Over the next few days I tried to message Carly, back in the day it was MSN Messenger, but the only response I ever got was Mother Hilda never forgets. After three days of this, about ten messages a day as well, I just said, screw Carly, I didn't need that in my life anyway. And I never hung out with her again, although I did see her from time to time in school, but she just refused to even look at me. I only ever had one more encounter with Mother Hilda, or whatever the hell she is, past that. I had quite a big yard before the river and had a sizable fire pit where I would have fires, Having Felix as my only real friend, I had many bonfires alone. And that was fine, I enjoyed the spectacle of it all, so one night I was having a fire and I started to get really into it. The flames went about maybe 15 feet high and I was having a great time. I'd whipped off my shirt, placed it on the six foot poking stick that I had and began chanting in gibberish. Don't ask me why I did this, but it was just a, a conscious weird action that I did at the time, and teenagers are weird, right? 
but on the other side of the fire, through a line of trees, was a small path my neighbour had to go into the woods. And when I look down there, I catch a glance out of the corner of my eye of something small in the trees. Thinking that it was a wild cat or maybe a baby deer, I stop to look at it. From the other side of the line of trees, I see Mother Hilda, her gaping maw wide open and facing in my direction. I go to scream as is a logical action, but Mother Hilda says no, and my raging inferno just goes out. Not even an ember stayed lit. The fire just went cold and dead. I looked back and there was nobody there. At this point, I decided that that was enough of that and I book it into the house as fast as my legs can go. When I get inside, my mum asks me why I'm not having the fire anymore. She rarely cared what I did, so I asked why she wanted to know. And my mum said that the nice girl who wears black asked about me about five minutes ago at the front door. And mum had told her that I was having a fire and she started to walk to the backyard. I go to my room, horrified, and message Carly on MSN to demand what the hell. I shouldn't have got an answer since she had just been at my door, but I did. And it read, Mother Hilda likes you. I haven't really told anyone this story before now, as I know it's one of my more outlandish ones and no one's probably going to believe me. Plus, my friend Felix still won't talk about it to this day. I met him a while ago, in fact, when I travelled back to Newfoundland and asked him if he remembered Carly in the creepy house. And he just looked at me with dead eyes and said, Mother Hilda is real, man. Don't fuck around. And just dead ass walked away from me. And I still have yet to make any sense of any of it. I live in a rural area that is slowly being developed. My house was built on a wooded lot that is fairly dense and is in an old forest. The trees are really tall, about two and a half times taller than a two-story home. And also, my neighborhood, if you can even call it that, is just a few houses built on a pretty long gravel road. But the entirety of the houses are built within this old, dense forest which extends about a mile in every direction. These homes are only about three years old. So I take my dog for a walk on the gravel road several times a day, but the night walks tend to be the most eerie. I've come along coyotes that creepily watch us from the woods until I shout at them. Actually, just a couple of weeks ago, I even walked up on a bear. I've learned to bring a bright 1000 lumen flashlight on my walks after this. But now for the creepy part. So sometimes when walking in these woods, they can just be eerily quiet. Anyone who spent a good amount of time in the woods knows that the woods are actually pretty noisy. However, on these nights, it's virtually silent. No wind in the leaves and no clacking of swaying tree branches, no crickets. And it's on these nights that I hate these walks. I just get the sensation that I'm being watched. Sometimes I even get goosebumps because the sensation that we're being watched is just so strong. On occasion I can hear branches or tree limbs snapping and now in the thick woods it's totally normal to hear a random limb break off and fall to the ground. But the sound of a limb breaking naturally versus the sound of one being stepped on are very different. Sometimes I can hear branches snapping more frequently than I should as well as if several people were hiding in the woods snapping branches off of trees or something. Most times, though, I just hear them around me, but I just can't find a cause. However, two nights ago, I heard the branches snapping again, but this was very clearly the sound of intentional branches being snapped this time, too. But the sound was coming from high up in the top of the trees. I shined my light up there, but couldn't see anything there, so I just kept walking. Then, more branches snapping. I stopped and looked again, but nothing. I started to walk again, but then another branch in the treetop snapped again. This time, I just kept walking, and as I did, I could hear the sound of snapping branches in the treetops following me. This continued for about two minutes as I started fast walking to my home, branches being snapped behind me in the trees. Then, tonight, which is what prompted this story, 
I again had the weird, uncomfortable feeling, but the walk was pretty much uneventful, which was different. As I'm almost home, my dog was sniffing around a bush. He ended up getting a small branch stuck on his leash, so I grabbed the branch and threw it back into the woods, hearing it hit a bush. However, the moment I turned to walk, I heard something behind me which startled us. I turned around to see the same branch. It was a fairly distinct shaped branch, almost like a large but skinny wishbone of a turkey, which I just threw into the woods, back at my feet. I looked into the woods, but there was nothing there, but something had definitely thrown back the branch back at my feet. And at this point, I went straight home after that, completely spooked. I really don't know what's going on, but it seems as if this last week or so that activity has just increased dramatically. I'm really not sure what to think of it all, or if there's some sort of precipitating factor. But either way, I hope you guys found this interesting, and as of now, I'm stopping my walks. This happened to me back in 2011. I was 20 years old and was living with my grandpa and sister. But my grandpa was in the hospital at the time and during the week that he was away, a lot of just weird things would happen at home. So my sister and I would often sleep in the living room. But one night my sister went out with her friends and left me alone at the house. It was around midnight and I decided to get some sleep since I had an early class the next morning. I'm afraid of the dark and I can't fall asleep without some sort of light, so I left the bathroom and the kitchen light on. In my house, it was just enough to partially illuminate the living room too. So, I'm on the couch just trying to fall asleep and as I'm laying there, I hear the keys in the door. The door opens and in walks my mum, or at least the silhouette of my mum. I was actually surprised to see her because, well, it was late and my mum lives about 30 miles outside the city. I asked her what she's doing there and she told me that she was going to spend the night and go to work from there in the morning. She sounded super irritated and when I think about it, I couldn't see her face, only the outline of her body and her curly hair. But without my glasses or contacts, my vision sucks pretty bad and it was somewhat dark in the living room. Anyways, she tells me that she's going to shower and walks down the hall and closes the bathroom door. I'm thinking, okay, random, but whatever, and I look at my phone and it's one in the morning now, so I decide to just try and go to sleep for real, and eventually I manage to. I guess some time passes, and I end up jolting awake from my sleep with just an overwhelming sense of dread. I notice that the door to the bathroom is still closed, and I call out to my mum, but I get no answer. I go to the bathroom and open the door, but the room is empty. Getting even more creeped out, I search the entire house calling out for her until I realize eventually that I'm all alone. At this point, I start crying because I'm just too freaked out, so I call my sister and ask where she is. Thankfully, she had just pulled up and was talking to a friend in the driveway. When she comes inside, I told her what happened and she was obviously really weirded out. I look at my phone and it's a little after 2.30 in the morning so I force myself to calm down and I go back to sleep. The next morning I called my mum and asked if she came over the night before and she sounds confused because she was at her house the entire night. This was the weirdest and creepiest thing that has ever happened to me. I know that I wasn't dreaming and was actually awake when I was talking to this person or thing posing as my mum but... Who the hell was I actually talking to? Let me know what you guys think. I'd like to preface this by saying that I do not believe in ghosts. So I was walking through the woods after fishing for the better part of the day and I decided to stay out real late and try and fish up some bullheads from a local watering hole. I was only about 13 and stayed out way later than I normally would. Usually I would take a trail home but decided to cut through some thicker brush to get to my grandparents house so that I could call my mum. I knew that she'd probably be freaking out a bit even though this happened from time to time. There was an abandoned graveyard on my route too. 
I don't remember what the story was about it, but I knew it was there. I had wandered past it before, never really checked it out. It's all just overgrown and wild anyway. And I knew that if I followed on the outskirts of the graveyard that I'd hit the road and be home free. The day had been pretty chill overall for my late spring day, but I swear in my teenage brain that it was just getting colder. I remember looking at my breath and thinking how weird it was that it hadn't gotten so cold. It was overall a pretty bright night, a near full moon, but in the woods it was really hard to see. The graveyard was wide open, no trees, and it was well lit. As I was walking up, I noticed that the ground was covered in a thin layer of fog and remember looking into the graveyard and not really registering what I saw at first. It was a person, which at first didn't seem odd, so I kept quiet and walked into the woods a bit more so I didn't get spotted. I didn't know who it was, so I just wanted to keep clear at this point. I stepped behind some of the trees and lost sight of them for a moment, and when I came back around the tree, they were just gone. Which was weird, because I was behind the tree for maybe a few seconds tops. I didn't hear anything, and I walk a bit further, keeping an eye out. And at this point, I must admit that I was a bit creeped out near the graveyard was a, a rundown, a barn of sorts I suppose. I'm not really sure what it was but as I got closer to it I could see that someone was inside. I got a good look at them too and it was a woman, probably in her 50s. The way the moonlight hit her made her look incredibly pale too and strangely she seemed to be digging but I didn't hear anything. No sounds of a shovel or her making noise in any way and I was maybe 30 feet away, so I should have heard something. I could see that she stopped though, and then she just disappeared behind some debris. And at this point, I decided to get the heck out of there and quickly moved to get out of the road. I tried to keep track of her, looking for where she went, but I just couldn't find her. It was like she just literally disappeared. I kept trucking though, and came out to the road... The fog was pretty much covering the road at this point, a small country road, fields on one side and woods on the other. As I walked down the road, she would just randomly appear in front of me at times, and I started hiding and basically playing cat and mouse with her. Each time I saw her, she was hard to see, only in the moonlight and stuck to the remnants of some of the old houses nearby. She always looked pale and just never made any noise. Once I got past the part of the road which had a number of barn foundations and home remnants, I never saw her again and it instantly started getting warmer. It creeped me out so much too that I just never went back that way again. I don't know who or what that was but I told my uncle about it and he went and checked it out, thinking that maybe someone was trying to excavate the graves. But when he got back he said that there wasn't anything messed with. And in the end, they thought that I was lying. It still gives me the shakes just typing this out because I know it was most likely someone wandering around looking for stuff or checking the place out. But what teenage me remembers just didn't seem natural. It was also weird that she just never made any noise. She also seemed to be able to just appear and move around me. At one point, she was right behind me and I swear a moment later that she was in front of me again. So we were out camping, but we were way out in the middle of nowhere on BLM land in Colorado. But we drove for an hour and a half down a forest service road and didn't see another soul the whole time. And you could definitely see headlights and hear cars for miles away from our campsite. In other words, it's not like somebody could have just snuck up unnoticed. So we had three cars with us and eight people, just got done eating, cleaned up, it was getting dark so we went to the cars real quick before hitting our tents for the night. And somebody had slashed the front tire on each of the three cars with what appeared to be a box cutter. Now, everyone thought it was a prank but it became very apparent quickly that it wasn't. All of us were beyond spooked, like panicking a bit, scary to watch spooked. We all had spares and one dude had a gun, so we threw on our donuts while the guy literally guarded us and then we just got the hell out of there. 
I still have nightmares about it sometimes though, just knowing that there was some person probably watching us, maybe wanting to even harm us, just standing out there in the darkness. And it makes me feel physically ill to this day. My dad and I went hiking a few days ago, and my dad is a waterfall fanatic. He wants to see as many as possible in his life. So, he and I are hiking along a very pretty trail. We're hiking along a river, it's flowing nicely. There's mountains all around us. The trail is weaving around these big beautiful boulders. I'm hiking at most 30 feet ahead of him, I'd say, looking for a spot to stop and have a sit down for a picnic lunch, and as I rounded a blind curve in the trail, I just freeze. Sitting on a stump, maybe 10 feet off to the right of the trail, is a guy. But he's wearing one of those colourful Baja hoodies with the hood pulled up and a half mask with rabbit ears. He sees me and stands up right as my dad rounds the corner. We're all three sizing each other up in silence and my dad addresses him. Hey, what's up buddy? The masked man tips his head as if he was deciding what to do with this. And then he says back, Not much, man. You aren't the guys I'm waiting for. Have a good day. Then he turns and jogs off quickly into the woods. Strapped on his lower back was a large hunting knife and he also had a pistol on his hip. We lost sight of him pretty quickly. We hadn't seen a soul on the trail all day and we'd been hiking for almost three hours. Needless to say, we left the waterfall for another day and just quickly turned around. Once we were off the trail, we reported it to the local forest service and the police, but they said that they couldn't do much aside from keep an eye out for any suspicious activity. The masked guy didn't have a backpack or water or pretty much anything, which makes me think that he either stashed it somewhere or was maybe camping and waiting nearby. I hate to admit it, but I desperately wanted to go after the guy and ask who he was actually waiting for and why. This story starts around the fall of 2017. I was walking back to work from lunch when I passed this girl and noticed she got up and started walking behind me. She took a different route and didn't follow me, but a few days later, it happened again, but this time, she was definitely following me. I assumed that she was just following me at the time because where my office building is situated, you have to go up a set of stairs and pass a few other buildings and she didn't follow me into the building. But after a while, I noticed we took the same train home too, and a lot of the time she would be watching me. When we made eye contact, she would always look away, but then she continued looking at me when she thought that I wasn't looking. There's a Whole Foods across from my office too, and I went there for lunch a couple of times during the week. I started seeing this girl sitting in the window for lunch, and she would almost always get up as soon as I left and walk the same way I did. Around this time, I began seeing her more frequently too. During lunchtime or when I got to the metro, she was always just there. After a couple of months of this, I started noticing that she would get off at the same station as me sometimes. Sometimes, she would walk the same way as me too. But once I got to my place, I live in a condo with my brother, she would always pass by but never follow me up to the entrance. During this time, I started receiving phone calls at work from random phone numbers that, at the time, I assumed were spam. There would either be silence on the end, or the person would just hang up immediately. I also started receiving fake Facebook requests from people that I already knew or was already on my friends list. December 2017 comes, and by this time, I'm not going to the Whole Foods as often. If she gets off at the same station as me, I go into a restaurant or go shopping for groceries before I go home. Around this time, an old friend that I went to high school with contacts me kind of out of the blue as well. She said that she wanted to follow me on Instagram, and we text a couple of times and I accept a follow request. She contacts me again about a month later from a different number, but this time she's texting me frequently. And I'm talking just about every day or every other day. I'm not one to be mean or show when I'm annoyed too often, but after months of this, when she asks if she's texting me too frequently, I don't hesitate to tell her that she could lay off a bit. 
She stops for a week or so, then starts texting frequently again. This whole ordeal, I know, should have sent red flags up for several reasons. During this time, she would ask me so many random questions, like when you would do when you're trying to get to know someone. She would ask for selfies, which I declined because I don't like taking pictures of myself. And I would tell her that there are plenty of pictures of me on Facebook. She would ask what I'm doing on the weekends and the names of my friends on occasion, which I wouldn't tell her because I thought it was weird that she'd want to know my friends' names. I only sent her a couple of videos of fun things that I do, but that was pretty much it. August of 2018 rolls around eventually, and I am still seeing Creepy Girl everywhere during the week. Eventually, I get pulled into my boss's office. He says that a few co-workers received fake screenshots from Facebook of me talking badly about them. Now, I never post on Facebook, and would never talk shit about my co-workers on social media. I don't have a grudge with any of them, and nor do I know anyone who has a problem with me. I'm a fairly easygoing guy, and I managed to clear things up with everyone involved and still had my job by the end of it. Of course, my friend is still texting me fairly frequently, and I tell her what happened a couple of days later when I got home from work. I tell her that I don't want to get too much into it, but she keeps pushing for more details. I finally told her that I was just going to go to bed, and she got the message. But the more I thought about all the time she texted me, though, the more uneasy I got about the whole thing. Some things that she just said just didn't make sense, especially from the way I remember her. We kept in touch over the years, though, but just not as frequently, and we hadn't touched base for a while before I heard from her in December. A couple of weeks later, I decided to reach out to my friend on Instagram. But the Instagram that she had last messaged me through, it just wasn't there. However, there was still an Instagram for her that I followed and that follows me back. I reach out to her and ask what her phone number was, and the phone number is completely different. And it turns out that she was never the one texting me, nor did she request following me on Instagram. I eventually track the number and it turns out to be from one of those fake phone number apps. I request to be blocked from the service and I never hear from my friend again. After talking about it with my brother and a couple of friends, I'm almost 100% certain that it was the girl that's been following me. These things only started after she appeared too, with the phone calls to my office, the fake Facebook requests, etc. A few days before I was pulled aside by my boss too, my friend texted me and told me that she had a weird feeling about me and wanted to make sure that I was okay. I just thought that she was being weird at the time and didn't think too much of it. This whole ordeal is really scary though when I look back on it because I sent videos of myself and even my address at one point to my friend. And my friend even confirmed a post that my brother made with pictures that he tagged of me on Facebook. I was texting a stranger for eight months about my life and they also apparently have access to my Facebook page. I still see this girl from time to time since she obviously works in the same area as me. She doesn't follow me around as much but when she does see me on the metro, she always watches me or sits somewhere that she'll be able to make eye contact with me. I'm always careful now if anyone texts me from an unrecognizable phone number and I'm just paranoid. I know that this story is just a bit all over the place, especially with the conclusion that I came to of the girl posing as my friend, but I just had to get this off my chest. And also, I would love to know what you guys think I should do next. So this just happened uh, an hour or two ago, and I'm pretty freaked out. I have a Wi-Fi enabled baby monitor in my bedroom so we can watch my five month old son when he's sleeping in his bassinet when my husband and I are downstairs. I tend to be nude when I'm in my bedroom in the second story of my house as I don't have central air and it's summer in Wisconsin USA and today is currently over 80 degrees. I was laying in bed drinking a beer and watching TV when I noticed the light blinking on the baby monitor which was currently facing toward the bed as my son had been in a co-sleeper on the bed with my husband last night. I work overnight shifts in a hospital. But for our monitor, a, a light blinking on it means that someone is watching via the website or app for the monitor. 
I jokingly sent a text calling my husband a creeper and was flipping off the camera and talking to it, but found it odd that it took him several minutes to read my message. He was at work at this time, but when he finally responded, I could say the cliche that my blood ran cold, but that would be embellishing. He said that he hadn't opened the app for the camera in weeks and definitely wasn't the one watching, and advised that I unplug the camera, which I did. I don't know who was watching me or how they could have gotten a hold of the login info for the monitor, but it was pretty creepy, that's for sure. Fifteen years ago, I had the misfortune of meeting Dave. I was new to riding the bus to school and when my first day came, I hopped on and took a seat towards the front. I didn't happen to know anyone on the route and sat by myself with my headphones in, rocking some now classic Good Charlotte. Back then, I didn't get much attention from the opposite sex, but I could just feel eyes burning into the back of my head. I turned a couple of times to look behind me and that's when I saw Dave. He had light eyes, brown curly hair and quickly looked away every time I caught him staring. This went on for about a week before he finally said something to me. He told me that I had nice hair and he liked my band t-shirts. He asked right off the bat if I would be his girlfriend and I said absolutely not. I didn't even know him and his creepy staring made me so uncomfortable. He brushed past my quick no though and told me that there was a newly instituted hug toll that needed to be paid before getting on and off the bus. I just kind of stared at him as he blocked the center aisle and gave him a half-hearted one-armed hug. I know, I know. Why would you hug the guy when you felt like he was a creep? Well, I had pointed him out to a few people in school and everyone I talked to said that he was the nicest person they'd ever met and just a bit of an odd duck. But back then, I was worried about hurting anyone's feelings or being seen as rude, so I just went with it. I mean, I have brothers on the spectrum and maybe he was too or something. But the next thing I know... Dave had joined my photography classes, my after-school programs, and I saw him around every corner and in every hallway of the school. He started popping up from behind things to try and hug and tickle me, and meanwhile, everyone just kept going on with the chorus of, he's a super sweet guy and just an odd duck bullshit. Well, when I found out that he was telling people that I was his girlfriend, I knew that I needed to put my foot down at this point. It was around this time that I became unwilling to pay the hug toll and feed his delusions. And that was when things really took a turn. Suddenly, anonymous notes were popping up in my locker. But most of the notes said always and nothing else. Some had longer declarations of love, but the always ones got me the most. The simplicity of the message gave me chills. Always. I knew it had to be Dave, though, and my suspicions were confirmed when pictures of me began showing up along with the notes. The pictures were always taken from a slight distance and clearly without my knowledge. And they were black and white and developed on the same type of paper that we used in photo class. And I knew that it had to be Dave. I mean, who else would be doing this? I finally got scared, though, one Saturday afternoon as I was watching TV in my bed. Because... I heard Dave's voice next to my bedroom window. He said that he watched me walk home one day to see where I lived and wanted to stop by for a visit. He said that he knew I wouldn't let him in, so he figured he'd just stop by the window to talk. And how he knew which window was mine was a thought that chilled me even more. But the way that this was escalating, I knew I needed to get the adults involved at this point. My mum thought that I was exaggerating... He was just young and infatuated and hormonal, according to her. She acknowledged the notes and the pictures as weird, but nothing other than some serious infatuation. So I went to an instructor at the school I knew that I could talk to and laid it all out on the table. Mr. K had also had Dave as a student and noticed some of his quirks and obsessive behavior and didn't doubt my story for a moment. He spoke to Dave's guidance counsellor and they both sat down with Dave and, I assume, told him that he was making me uncomfortable and to stop. And this pissed Dave right off. 
He stormed up to me in the lobby of the school with a glass rose in his hand and threw it at the wall behind me. It shattered and he screamed in my face about how I'd broken his heart, just like the rose. A few teachers broke up the situation and a few days later, he dropped out of the school and I went eight years without actually seeing Dave. Eight years later, I was craving some mac and cheese, as one does, and I hit up a popular spot in town to grab some to-go. I looked behind the counter and there's Dave. I had no idea that he was working there and debated leaving for a moment. I decided to stay in line to get some food though. High school was a long time ago after all. I hadn't heard from him since that day in the lobby. Surely this guy could not still have this obsession with me. And it was a huge relief when another register opened and a young woman would take my order. I honestly wondered at the time if maybe he was even more mortified and didn't want to interact with me at all and had her open for that reason. But I was wrong again. He seemed to take my visit to his work as a sign that I was actually ready to love him. At least, that's what I've been told since then. I got a friend request from him that night and immediately deleted the request. A few nights later, I'm getting home and walking across the street when... I see that someone is standing on the side of my house, opposite the door in the shadows. Well, I haul ass into the house, lock everything, and watch. It's really dark out, but I turn on the lamppost out front and hope to God that I was just imagining things, but then I see him. He slinks from the side of the house, trying to stay in the shadows, and runs across the street and towards the house that he grew up in. Unfortunately for him, I saw his stupid curly brown hair. I called the police and reported this, but of course there wasn't much that they could do. There was no proof. He hadn't approached me or tried to get in. It couldn't be proven it was him too, and they did agree to keep someone on the lookout in the area, and I saw police patrolling more than usual the following night. Eventually, the police patrol died down, and that's when the late night knocking began. I could hear it softly on the windows and occasionally on the back door, but never dared to answer or get close enough to look. It wasn't every night, maybe two or three nights a week I'd say. The police never seemed to be close enough in the area when it happened to catch him either, so that was pretty unfortunate. A couple of weeks after the knocking began though, I received an envelope wedged into my screen door. It was full of creepy candid pictures from high school and another note that said always... And at this point, I had had enough and didn't know what to do. I went out to my car to drive everything down to the police. I don't care if I couldn't prove it was him. I just wanted to have some official record of what was happening to me. And that was when I saw the word, always, carved into my back bumper. And I lost it. I just broke down in heavy sobs as I drove to the police station. And again, all they could do was take a report. But I decided on another course of action. In my rage, I took a picture of the police station sign and of the report being filed. I sent them to Dave over Facebook Messenger. I told him to leave me the hell alone, that the police were involved and he didn't want to ruin his life in this way. And he simply responded, you're right, and disappeared. I've since heard that he stalked a widow shortly after her husband had died, pounded at her windows and doors trying to break in until she screamed out of the top window that she was calling the police. I can only begin to imagine how she felt trying to grieve her husband and deal with Dave's obsessive ways at the same time. You may now find yourself wondering if the mac and cheese was worth it, and the answer is definitely not. It was nowhere near warm enough and also came with the side of Stalker. I was walking around my neighborhood alone once, enjoying the night air and watching the stars. There was this little pond near my house with a wooded area that had trees, a bench and a rope swing that went out over the water and whatnot. I sat down on the bench to look at the stars and I heard some rustling off to my right towards the trees. But bears were not uncommon where I'm from, so I took out my flashlight and shone it around over there, and I didn't see anything. It obviously freaked me out, so I kept my flashlight on and my senses aware, but I stayed on the bench to mull over my thoughts and watch the sky some more. 
Honestly, I don't know why I did that too, because that's some pretty typical horror movie shit right there. Anyway, I had a few minutes pass and I hear nothing, so I lean back onto the porch and start to relax a bit. I'm staring up at the sky with my flashlight pointed downwards so as not to create any light pollution when I notice something in the tree in my peripheral vision. I couldn't tell what it was, but the branch was swaying lightly and the rustling noise was back too. I immediately sat up and stared at it, but hadn't shown my flashlight at it yet in case of pissing off some huge bird or something else. And quite frankly, I don't think I've ever been that scared. I remember my heart was beating so fast and I could taste blood. I stared at it for what seemed like forever and it slowly stopped moving, but the shape was still there. Bears do climb trees sometimes, so I was hesitant to run away in case that was it. So I just kept staring at it. After a while, I mustered up the little raisin-esque kahunis to shine my fucking light at the tree and it was a man. A fucking man. In the tree crouched in the tree like some silent naked monkey. He had no expression on his face, but his eyes were open really, really wide. When my light landed on him, he started to move like he was going to come down, but I didn't stick around to see if he did. I jumped the bench and just ran for the hills. I ran to my house, around to the back door, and locked myself in without looking back once. I went around and made sure every window and door was locked, and I even checked the attic. And these days... I try not to go out alone anymore. Before I start, I want to make it clear that I really don't know what happened to you. I don't know if it was something paranormal or just a really creepy dude, but I wanted to share it anyway. So this happened to me back when I was 16 years old. It was summer and I was spending my days out at a family's home in the countryside. My father always gave me a lot of freedom, so I was used to taking long strolls in the heart of the night. It's a rather small town, and I know most of the residents. I never had a reason to be scared. It was around 2am, and I was talking on the phone to a friend, and jokingly I said that I was going to jump the graveyard's fence and take a look around. I was kind of determined to do it, I must admit, but my phone's battery died halfway through, and I didn't feel like going on without my friend talking to me, so I decided it was time to go back home, and I took a shortcut. Now, I know this sounds very cliche, right? Taking the dark shortcut instead of going through the civilized world and stuff like that, but you have to understand the situation. It was something that I was extremely used to, and as I said, nothing dangerous ever happened in that town. This shortcut is a two-kilometer road built on the side of the mountain that became a pedestrian area after a section of it collapsed under the weight of a truck. After this event, all the lampposts were dismantled as well, so using a flashlight is pretty much mandatory. So after a few minutes of walking, I started hearing someone whistling and being late at night and on a remote road, I accelerated the pace. It followed me for a good amount of time, and every time I turned my head to see if I could spot a flashlight, I couldn't find anything. But going around without a flashlight can make you fall in the ravine, so this was really odd. Then, it stopped. I stopped walking too, to check if it was still following, whoever it was. And that was when I heard rustling within the bushes. The year before this, I had a frightening experience with a boar on that same road, so I turned off the flashlight and tried to stand completely still without making any sound. And the classic click of a camera and the flash came out from the bushes. And that was when I lost it. I ran until I was out of breath and still I wasn't near the end of the road. I took a couple of seconds to relax because my heart was going to explode and I turned to face the woods. I stopped right in front of the pathway, but before I even realized that I was very exposed, I heard quick footsteps coming at me from that small path, so I ran again, but this time, I didn't stop until I was home. After that, nothing really spooky ever happened again. I didn't find a picture of myself on my threshold, no creepy figures stalked me in the night, nothing came out from the woods. I actually didn't tell my father about this in fear that he would restrict my freedom too, and I'm glad that nothing frightening actually happened afterwards. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had the courage to go back to my family home every year. Sometimes I go on night strolls on that road still, but never without a friend or a relative with me. 
since that day. So all these things happened over a span of three years that I lived there beginning in 2012. My childhood friend from years back asked me if I would be a roommate. I needed out of my parents' home at the time and she needed a roommate so it seemed like a good situation. Nestled in a suburban area was this cabin. The cabin dates back to sometime in the 1700s we think. The road that the cabin is off of bears the same name as the original family of the house too. But they owned a large portion of the land that is now one of the largest cities in the US. But search American Colonial Cabin and you'll see a swath of images that it looks like. But we originally think that it was used as slave quarters as this is a tobacco country and then later found out that it was a stable house. The stable house theory checks out as our dog dug up a horseshoe once and I actually still have that horseshoe. So the night we moved in I just knew the place was eerie, but there were no doors to the upstairs, my room, no doors to the downstairs bedroom, her bedroom was an addition that someone added on in the late 80s, the previous owners also added a much needed kitchen and bathroom as the original layout did not have either, and now that you've got a decent imagery of what I was working with, I'll start with the posting. So when moving in, like I said, I immediately felt a feeling of just being watched, the house always felt dark and cold and moist, but much like a cellar if I had to compare it to something. It was par for the course with that type of house, but there was just something else about it. And it all started with scratching. Every night I would be in bed and I would wake up to this scratching directly underneath my bed by my head. At first I thought it was mice, obviously, but when I listened to it long enough I realized that the scratching was a long drawn out one like a foot long pull then it repeated I just covered my head in the end muffled my ears and closed my eyes I was a 23 year old man by the way and I felt like I was cowering but I was not about to tussle with wood scratching spirits that was for sure alright so one night I heard it start and normally I would have been asleep but this time I was up late and I heard it it started on the ceiling on the far side of my room and then it went back down the hall. And then it scratched its way to directly underneath me. After a while the scratching went across the room and back to the wall and then it was just gone. And here is how I know that it definitely wasn't mice. That my walls were solid wood as the inside logs were the same as the outside. The floor had no space between the ceiling below and the floor above. Uh, like I said, it was an old cabin. Obviously, I got pretty scared by this and started sleeping downstairs at this point. The roommate, now my wife, asked what was up and I told her. She said the same stuff was going on when she was home alone too and this was in the very first week that we got there. But here's the creepy part. So when we moved in, I had to unscrew all of the screws that the previous renter had put into the windows. I had to unscrew one of the exterior doors that he screwed shut. But we had to clean out the weird rabbit food, we think, from the oven. And we had to write, doesn't live here, on hundreds of mail order catalogs the previous renter received. We always joked that the guy was a shut-in Satanist or something. But nowadays, I don't think that we were probably too far off in the end. But we both started sleeping downstairs in the living room and felt comfortable in numbers. But the eerie feeling was easier to deal with if someone was with you, and that was until one night. So I had a dream that a dark force was approaching me. It was in third person as if I was watching myself sleep. The entity starts looming over my head and all the while I feel a pressure building in my head and a high pitch ringing in my ears. It got so intense that I sprung up from my sleep and looked around the room. About a second later, the TV shut off just cut off by itself. We had been having problems with the TV randomly turning on and off, but this time was just far too coincidental to be brushed off like everything else. Also, I knew that I went to bed with the TV turned off. I mean, I cut it off personally, so why was it on in the first place? We started sleeping in her room after that night. She told me that nothing really happens in her room, which is why we chose to do that. 
But maybe because it was an addition or something? I don't know, but... Well, our ghost played matchmaker and now we're trying for a kit. Married for five years. Anywho, once I was upstairs reading and as I was falling asleep, my window just started opening and shutting by itself. I was already at my wit's end with these spirits, so the next day I set up the same situation. Same thing. And it's funny how it never does that when I'm not in there. I ended up yelling and telling it to just leave us alone and I was tired of its shit. And holy smokes, it kind of worked. For a while at least. Then, when I was home alone, clocks started going off as soon as my wife would leave. Drawers would open and there was banging on the front door and just everything. Then, over time, it just stopped, slowed down and ultimately nothing. I guess as I matured there that it just stopped messing with me. Today, my in-laws live there, they were my landlords, and the home is cute, homely and warm. I spend time there alone and I don't feel any malice at all. It was a weird experience and I would do it all over again if I had to. I'm open to questions, but this, I swear to you, is 100% real and I can give further details if needed. So I've been a career paramedic, but this happened when I'd only been one for about five years. This has never left me to this day, and I shit you not, it happened exactly like this. So I was driving home on a rural highway one rainy afternoon. It was really pouring and traffic had slowed to about 50 miles per hour. I was following two vehicles and we rounded a bend into the road as a small sports car on the opposite side crossed the center line and hit the small SUV that was leading the three of us vehicles on my side of the road. I immediately pulled over and called 911 because it was a bad one. I got out to check on everyone and there was wailing coming from the SUV on the side of the road. That was always a good thing because people are breathing if you know they're screaming, so I went down into the field past the ditch to check on the sports car. There were two young guys in the car, and the force of the impact had driven the engine to where the front passenger seat should be. The passenger was still buckled, his crumpled hand grabbing the oh shit handle overhead, but the entire section of the car shoved into the back seat area. The back of the car had peeled away, as had the passenger's top of his head. His jawbone was jutted out raw and jagged. He was clearly deceased, but I felt for a pulse anyway, all while listening to the gasping and ragged, dragging breaths of the driver. There was no pulse on the passenger, so I tried to figure out how to deal with the driver, but there was really nothing I could do. The car had literally wrapped around him, and it would take an extrication team time to get him out. Listening to his dying breathing, I apologized out loud to him that I couldn't do more, told him that I was sorry to leave him but others needed my help too. In my heart, I knew that he would never make it, so I went to render aid where I was needed. In triage, we call this black tagging, a patient who isn't going to survive. I did what I could for the family in the SUV. Emergency medical people and fire services got to the scene and took over. The entire family had injuries, but all survived, thankfully. Unfortunately, though, the mother had permanent brain damage and even lost an eye. But the whole day, those two guys that were in the red sports car just stayed on my mind. That night, I was home alone getting ready for bed with just the bedside lamp on, and I heard something in the hallway. It got louder as it came closer down the dark hallway toward my open door. It was like a, a thump and then a drag and a thump and a drag again. And I absolutely froze. A broken hand curled around the frame of my doorway. And then that kid from the passenger seat was standing there, busted up like he was in the car. He looked at me and I can't recall the exact words of what he said, but it was something along the lines of, Hey, my friend wants you to know that he understands. He wants you to know that he's okay. Well, we both are. Thanks for trying. He stood there for a few more seconds, just looking at me. And then he stepped back into the shadows, let go of the doorframe, and I listened to him drag back down the hallway and into nothing. 
I obviously turned on every damn light that I could. I slept with the lights on for two full weeks after that, and I clipped out their death notices from the paper later that week. Turns out that they were both high school seniors on their way home from a wrestling tournament. Their car apparently hyperplaned from what the investigation determined. I never had recognized the blonde-headed kid had he come to me as his healthy, unwrecked self. It freaked me the hell out that he came to me busted up like that, and I still have the newspaper clippings, and I will never forget them, nor that ghastly visit that night. This story takes place at a mall where the establishment had just built a cute rubber playground. At the time, I was six years old and was simply enjoying playing at the area as my family was shopping only a few feet away. But then came a wrinkly-looking tanned man with a long beard, skinny and balding. He approached a small Latino boy and began talking to him about cool toys that he had in his van. Now, at this time, I knew what stranger danger meant, but to my shame, I only stood there, shocked that this was all happening. More so, too, when this boy was agreeing to follow him where he kept his toys. I remember thinking, oh my goodness, this boy is really going with this man. Doesn't he know what stranger danger is? If that didn't make things worse, the boy was so excited that he went ahead to invite his brother, around the same age as I am, and they went off together. I honestly didn't know what I could do, run off into this giant mall after them and get lost, tell my mum what was going on, would she even believe me? Where were their parents anyway? But as I stood there, watching them walk off together into the distance, so did the opportunity. I stopped playing and walked into the store where my mum was and told her in a shy voice what happened. I was struggling to find the words, but I told her something along the lines of, hey mummy, I saw something strange happen. I saw an ugly old man walk off with two boys, like the kind of men you warned me about on the news. She just looked at me and smiled, not seeming to entirely understand what I was saying. I pressed the issue more so, but she only responded, Don't worry, mummy is almost done shopping for shoes. She proceeded to shower me with compliments, in the kind of tone mums reserve for when they're playfully talking to babies. But this only made me more distressed. I could feel the time to act slipping away and I remember telling her, I'm serious, there was a creepy man over there talking to children. I pointed at the direction where they once stood and I remember watching her face attentively and saw a flicker of understanding but she just brushed it off as doubt settled in. And that was the end of that encounter. A few days later I was watching the news with my mum and I saw the same boys. I felt placed on the spotlight again on what to do, but I knew my mum would never take me seriously. I was only six and my family were illegals who wouldn't want to involve themselves with the police anyway. I asked my mum what she thought about those two boys, but she had no opinion because she wasn't paying attention to the TV anyway. I must admit that I often look back with regret of what I could have done. The parents may teach their kids what to do when these incidents happen to them, but... I don't know what I could have done as a witness. I felt as if I'd done what I could do telling my mum, but I was just too young in her eyes to be taken seriously. Honestly, I hate that playground and I never ended up playing there after that incident. I'm 21 now, but I still see parents dropping off their kids there and shop around the area. And just what a dumb place to have anyway, as it only encourages so much negligence. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and if you would like to help me out, then please go ahead and watch another video by clicking on a card on the screen. As always guys, thanks for all the love and support and I'll see you mates in the next one.